Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, robots may be something that seems sort of like they're out of a science fiction movie, but they have now become an essential tool for surgeons, and they're being used right here in Tampa Bay. In fact, the Moffitt Cancer Center has been using something called the Da Vinci Robot since 2009. Joining me to tell us all about how that works is Dr. Julio M. Pao Sang. He is the chairman of Genito Urinary Oncology and chief of surgery and director of robotics program at Moffitt Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Pao Sang. Thank you. And also Dr. David uh, Fenstermacher is chair of biomedical informatics at Moffitt. I love that word. I'll ask you about that later, Inform informatics. Thank you very much for being here today on Front Row Tampa Bay. Now, uh, Dr. Pao Sang, the Da Vinci robot, is the surgeon still necessary? Well, actually, uh, when we talk about robotic surgery, that's somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, robotic uh, is basically a technology. Um, the actual procedure is laparoscopy, meaning operating through small uh, openings. The traditional surgery um, is done by making an incision, a cut, depending on the access, it could be a six, eight, or even lo longer incision. Now, with laparoscopy, um, meaning operating through little openings, one transfers the access to an open procedure operating through little keyholes and punches. And the problem with laparoscopy is that it was very cumbersome to do. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy some use is operating with chopsticks. Uh, probably, <laughs> with chopsticks. Yeah, probably <laughs> in China, like that. that would be possible, but yes. here, you know, with a, it's a little bit different. But in any rate, uh, what the technology allows is for the surgeon to do the operation more precisely, and it's basically like having little, little hands inside without not being inside. So it allows for the surgeon to take those surgical skills that one has as an open surgeon to do it through the little openings to operate inside. Now, what the technology allows is for the surgeon to, uh, for one, see better, because the view is not only magnified, but it's three-dimensional. It's like you go to the movies and get the goggles and see everything in depth. Yes, and I read that it was mm -hmm. the vision system, 3D. They actually yes. can see much more precisely than mm -hmm. if he was standing over the area, yes. he, he or she mm -hmm. himself. And that allows to uh, see better mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that one is basically immersed in the area that one is operating in. The other thing is that because the technology allows for the instruments to articulate inside, it's like having little hands inside. So one is not, again, operating like with shop fix, but mostly with little robotic arms inside. So but is the surgeon mm -hmm. operating the little hands, the, the, yes. the tools? Yes, and that's the reason why the surgery is actually done by the surgeon, using the robotic technology as an interface to better do the surgery. Ah. Mm -hmm. There's always that uh, thought, uh, some think that it's the robot which is, who is doing the operation, but it's not really <laughs> right. the robot. It's basically an interface to facilitate uh, the procedure. Uh, Dr. Pausang, we're watching video now. Explain, mm -hmm. explain what's going on here. Yes, those are the robotic arms that are basically hooked up to the little keyhole openings. And mm. the left, you can see the little opening. And those are the robotic arms moving, which basically <gasps> the surgeon is controlling. Look at that. And those instruments inside are like the surgeon's hands which are manipulated by the surgeon there. He has little joysticks, and it's basically like doing an operation um, uh, through a video arcade uh, uh, game. Right, that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And do you know, I don't know if we know what that was being, what, what procedure that was being done right there? Well, there are several procedures. Um, basically, the most uh, common one currently is for a gynecologic and urological procedures. Mm -hmm. um, it all started with uh, robotic prostatectomies, removing the prostate uh, through uh, the small incisions using robotic technology. And then it expanded to GYN, gynecology. I didn't look uh, precisely at what was done, uh, but uh, those are the most common ones. And then it expanded little by little to other specialties. Uh, can you tell me why it's called the Da Vinci? Well, that's a good question. Probably um, there are some stories about it, <laughs> but basically it has to do with innovation. Da Vinci in uh, the 1500s uh, was uh, an inventor, and he invented many things that were ahead of his time with the technology available. So probably one of the thoughts is that the company named it uh, in a sense that it would further discoveries using that technology. Wasn't it Da Vinci who actually drew the drawing of the Vitruvian man, the one you see on all the, uh, the medical 
Yes, uh -huh. he's an icon. He That's was an right. inventor of many, many things, uh, technologies that uh, uh, fly, uh, which wasn't uh, available there, any of the mechanical things that were possible only centuries later uh, with better technology. So what are some of the advantages of using um, a robotic technology versus a surgeon doing it manually? Well, the advantage is that uh, one can do the procedure uh, laparoscopy uh, more uh, precisely. Because the robot is an interface to do laparoscopy, it allows to the sur uh, for the surgeons to, as we mentioned, see better, for one. For the other, to use the instruments uh, which are smaller in a smaller area than operating with instruments which are made for larger areas. Less, so, less trauma? Mm -hmm. So the analogy that I like to use also is like a watchmaker uh, who would be operating uh, with hammers and tools that mm -hmm. a carpenter would use versus uh, instruments that a watchmaker would use which are more microscopic. Because of that, uh, one doesn't do an incision, so there's uh, less pain less and discomfort pain? after the surgery. And quicker and be, recovery, possibly? And because there's not an incision, a patient recovery a little bit better. Excellent. Quicker. Now, you uh, have been involved in some research I was reading in the medical field about the um, genitourinary cancers, some, uh, some of the clinical trials you are involved in. Mm -hmm. So are, are you finding, through clinical trials, advantages to the robotic procedure for some of these cancers? Well, uh, more than clinical trials, uh, robotic uh, technology is more an application for what we do uh, to do it better. Like in radiation oncology, there are technologies which allow to do, deliver radiation better. Uh, there are different modalities. Uh, as well as in medical oncology for chemotherapy, for example, there are better ways of delivering chemotherapy. So it advances the way we apply the discoveries that we have. Uh, but it's not a very direct uh, uh, comparison. Most of the clinical trials now are directed at a better targeting therapies uh, mm -hmm. to uh, treat the organ, that w the cancer that one needs to treat, and spare other organs. Um, most of the clinical trials that we have uh, uh, are divided in uh, different types of trials. Uh, phase one, which are at the very beginning of discovery, and we have uh, several phase one trials at Moffitt. Uh, phase two trials, which are a little bit more uh, into uh, application. And then phase three trials, which are comparing a standard treatment uh, versus a new treatment which might make the standard treatment obsolete or less effective than the new treatment. So what cancers can be treated with this? With robotic technology? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, many cancers and the indication starts expanding. As I mentioned initially, uh, it was uh, GYN procedures mm -hmm. and urological procedures. In urological procedures, initially it was only uh, applicable to uh, prostate removals. Now, um, with experience, um, uh, it's expanded to removing part of the kidney, for example, what I call pulse nephrectomies. Uh, that was a very tough operation and it could be done open also. Uh, there you see the real uh, application of robotic technology because a partial nephrectomy, a partial removal of the kidney and now can be done uh, very safely mm -hmm. and more accurately with, uh, uh, through laparoscopy. So let me ask you something. I, I read that it, it also means that the surgeon could actually be in a totally different location, possibly one day, that could be due to the surgery remo remotely, not sitting right there. Is yes, that possible? that is possible. And in fact, uh, the history of uh, robotics uh, came about from the military, uh, trying to protect the medical personnel, attending the soldiers in the field oh. by remotely operating. So uh, this drove a lot of the developments in the technology. And uh, now there have been uh, demonstrations in which one could do the operation in California. Um, the surgeon could be in California and the subject could be in New York. Really? The yes. surgeon's in California, mm -hmm. and the patient is in New York, yes. and the surgeon is, that's amazing. Now, now this is investigational, right. um, mostly in animals, but uh, the point is that it's been demonstrated that it can be done. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Finstermacher here. Uh, tell me, Dr. Finstermacher, what informatics is. <laughs> informatics, sure. Uh, it's basically the science of data itself. So it's how we take raw data, whether it be clinical data or molecular data, transform that into information and eventually knowledge that can be used. So it's basically looking at the paradigm of using data going from the basic research applications and then translating that to the clinical care of a patient. Okay, so in layman's terms, what do you do with it? 
what do we do with it? <laughs> so that, good question. So one of the things that we were able to do, we've built a data warehouse, which is a state-of-the-art data warehouse through our partnership with both Oracle and Deloitte. This integrates the clinical data with the molecular data in such a way that we are able now to stratify patients for particular treatments that may be beneficial for a very small subset of patients with a particular disease. One of the examples of that is melanoma, where a particular mutation within a gene called BRAF is known to be effective for a particular drug. And these patients respond very well if they have this mutation to this particular drug. Through our database, we're able to find those patients and then either put them on that therapy or even suggest possible clinical trials where there are other drugs that respond to other mutations within the genome and the tumor are actually able to treat and produce better outcomes for the patient as a whole. So are you talking about moving from uh, the traditional systemic treatment of cancer that we're all familiar with to a more targeted individual approach depending on their genetics and the type of cancer they have? Absolutely. And it's not just about genetics, but it's also being able to better analyze the clinical data in combination with the molecular data. But there are some there are many new therapies that are coming out now where they have something that they call a companion diagnostic, which is that test that proves whether or not a patient has a particular mutation. Or we can also look at what we call gene signatures. So it might be a combination of anywhere of 30 to 50 genes that we're actually studying for a particular response to a therapy. And we're hearing a lot about women being tested for the gene for breast cancer. Um, are you finding that that's sort of an area of exploration that people want to know and, and is, is an area of research that you're exploring? Uh, absolutely. So it's not just with breast cancer, but the BRCA1, BRCA2 mm -hmm. genes, as right. they're called. Right. Uh, sure, uh, there is a family predisposition genetically uh, in those families for uh, developing breast cancer, especially at an early age. And so knowing that you have those mutations certainly helps you monitor your disease and capture it early because, as we know, if you can capture the disease earlier, uh, the chance of, of cure is much higher. So where's the research going then, not only identifying that you maybe have this heritable condition or family gene, but then to target that and actually look to a prevention or a cure in the future? I think it's both. I think it's both prevention because, once again, you know you can monitor your disease. So in the case of breast cancer, women would know how or make sure they have that annual mammogram. Uh, but also, those are genes that are driving the disease itself. And so drug companies now are able to look at that gene as well as others that are in the same pathway to look for ways to curtail the disease through new therapies. And that's some very active research going on both in the public but also in the private sector. Colon cancer, leukemia, is there research ongoing in those areas as well? Uh, well, leukemia is one of the poster childs for kind of personalized medicine in that uh, with uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, CML, Mm -hmm. uh, there is a particular gene that is only in the disease cells. And so a drug called Gleevec was produced many years ago that specifically targets the CML cells in the blood. And now through basically administration of this drug, it's an oral drug, for the rest of their lifetime it maintains the disease. So it's basically a cure in many ways. Uh, with other disease sites, we also see the same thing. Uh, there's another gene called KRAS. Uh, in colorectal cancer, but this is, a, this is a story that is now being repeated over and over again in various type of cancers, such as e EGFR gene in lung cancer. Here on Front Row Tampa Bay, we want people uh, coming to visit Florida, maybe for the first time uh, for the RNC, to be aware of what is going on business-wise, what the climate is like here. What would you say would be a big surprise to them about the medical research climate in this area? Personally, I think they'd be surprised to find out this is a hotbed for personalized medicine research. Uh, at Moffitt Cancer Center, we have a protocol called, called Total Cancer Care, which is a longitudinal prospective study where we have enrolled over 90,000 patients in 10 states around the country uh, to join this cause. And they both send us data. Well, the institution send mm -hmm, us the data. Mm -hmm. And we are able to then molecularly profile their tumors. And this has led to a huge amount of information that we now can have on tens of thousands of people such that we can come up with new discoveries. Uh, we can also do clinical trial matching before the trial even starts, understanding what is the inclusion exclusion criteria and then using our database to be able to search for those patients and analyze the molecular data such that we 
can then have a group of patients that can respond quickly to those drugs. And we have on the screen uh, just some of the uh, little information facts about the da Vinci robotics, uh, minimally evasive, as Dr. Palsang was talking about, Moffitt leading the way in using this for prostate, kidney, bladder, testicular, gynecologic, and uterine cancers, and uh, just um, faster recovery, less pain, lower risk, really exciting medical things going on in this area, and, and your research into the robotics, I mean, it's just, I think people will be delighted to hear that that Florida is a good place to do medical research. Yes, and uh, one of the things is that technology is moving so fast because uh, um, in that uh, insert it uh, talked about uh, urologic and gynecologic procedures, but uh, this has expanded very quickly in the last two years to thoracic procedures, uh, uh, doing lung surgery, uh, a GI surgery, operating on the bowel, uh, the pancreas, uh, so the indications have expanded tremendously. One of the things uh, that Dr. Festenmacher mentioned is that uh, we have the uh, infrastructure now for young researchers to look at our area to uh, be able to grow professionally, uh, for one, to develop networks that mm -hmm. were not available only five or 10 years ago. Excellent, all right. Dr. Uh, Fenstermacher and Dr. Palsang, thank you very much for being here with us on thank Front you. Row Tampa Bay. It's been a pleasure. Thank okay, you. take a break here. Coming up, how the Bay Area's largest hospital system is moving from sick care to well care.